at Acts 10 and 11 this morning, Who Am I to Hinder God? And you say, that's an unusual title. That title comes from what Peter himself says when he's talking about what happens uh, in Caesarea with Cornelius. Uh, if you have, depending on your Bible translation, it, your Bible translation may say instead, Who was I to stand in God's way? Who am I to oppose God? It could be any one of those things. Who am I to hinder God? I think is the, uh, maybe the ESV or the Holman Christian Standard Bible. But anyhow, that's where the title comes from, and that's what we're going to look at today. So you're still looking at your handout. Uh, we've got our Google Maps for the Bible. And um, today still, it's Joppa, Caesarea, and then back to Jerusalem. And then that next part, I've gone ahead and I've given you some information for next week. And then with our time icon, the clock icon, um, surprisingly, this story takes place, we think, almost 10 years after the day of Pentecost. You wouldn't think it was that long, would you? We would think maybe, maybe a year or two, but they estimate almost 10 years after that, which to me is a little bit shameful, isn't it? Because Jesus says before he goes back to heaven, um, he tells them, first of all, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And then he says, but you wait in Jerusalem, you're going to receive power. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And it makes me wonder what is in their minds as Christians, as spirit-filled Christians, when Jesus has said this to them, he's given them a command and then he's given them a promise, and then he's given them power to fulfill the promise. And it takes 10 years for them to get beyond their, their click, if you will. So we're gonna talk about that today. The other icon says first, because this is the first time the gospel really is preached to the Gentiles. Now some of you will say, yeah, 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 but what about the Ethiopian eunuch? We'll talk about him this morning. But to the Gentiles, as non-Jewish people, this really is the first time the gospel is preached. Can you imagine that? It takes 10 years for people to hear the good news. I read a testimony um, from a man who was in the US. Uh, he grew as a, he grew up <coughs> in China in the early, early years in China. He's a very elderly man now. And his father was a missionary in the western part of China and a missionary to the northwest and to the southwest in the areas of Tibet. And when he went to an area of Tibet, so this would have been in the 30s, in the 1920s and the 1930s. He went to an area of Tibet and he gathered in a, uh, with uh, lamas, with, with leaders, uh, with uh, uh, the, the Buddhist, the Tibetan Buddhist monks. He gathered with them and he told them the story of Jesus. And this is his own testimony. He told them the story of Jesus. This is in the early 30s. And he said that these elderly men shook their heads in disbelief. And they said, this cannot be true. As he talked about uh, Jesus and, and the grace that God gives, because Tibetan Buddhism especially is a religion of merit and, uh, and of, uh, based on works, as many religions are. Praise the Lord for what Jesus has done for us. And he said the, the lamas shook their heads and said, this cannot be true, especially the leader. This cannot be, this cannot be true. And when he asked him, why not? Why, why can't you believe? He said that the elderly man said, news this good and this wonderful, if it is true, why didn't we know it before now? Why weren't we told it before now? It can't be true. It can't be true. What an indictment against Christians, right? That it's, it's such good news. And we think about that, and today we're going to look at this story from a different perspective. We're not going through all the details of this story, but we're going to look at this story as, a hin as, as God dealing with hindrances to get to these non-Jewish people, and we're going to see ourselves in this story <coughs> as well. If you look at your handout again, hinder means to oppose, to stand in the way of, or to interfere with. 
uh, and then you'll see some other things as well. So you can look at that later if you want to. You can flip to the back side now, and then we're going to keep on. We're, we're going to keep on going. So here's our handout. If you want to write on it, you're welcome to. If you say, "Oh, I'm just going to look at it," that's okay as well. That's up to you. So we look again at this story that we have been talking about. Uh, for we talked about, I think it's been about three weeks ago now, and I want us to think about it and look at look at it in a in a different way. Here are Peter's words: "Who am I to hinder God?" But what I want to what I want us to see and what I want us to look at is this: God was going to do something wonderful. God wanted to break through in a new way. God had a big plan. He wanted to do something, but God was going to use people to do it. Now, when Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost, uh, he didn't say the day of Pentecost. They didn't know how long it would take. He just said, wait in Jerusalem until you receive power. They didn't even understand exactly what would happen. All they knew was Jesus had said, wait. He was going to, they were going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They didn't even really understand that. And then he said, you will receive power, and the power would be to do what God was calling them to do. So there we see a sovereign move of God. Now when I say sovereign move of God, what does that mean? It means it was all God. It was all God. All they had to do was wait on God, and they did that. They remained in prayer. They waited in Jerusalem. They were obedient to what God said, waiting for God to do what he said he would do. But after God did that, then God had a commandment for them. God had directions for them. After they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, well, he was living in them as they were Christians, but now he had come in power and God's work was going to be done through people. These days, from then until now, generally, generally, God works through people. In the, in the, when we talk about what's well, the sovereign move of God, we don't, I think, we don't see it in the same way as much. Sometimes you, you hear about great revivals somewhere, right? You say, wow, that great revival. If you will do some research, you know what you will find out? Somewhere, someplace, in a back room, there were people that were on their knees, on their faces before God, seeking God, praying for God to work and for God to move. God works through people. He works through people. So here is God in this story. He wants to reach the Gentiles. The Jews don't yet understand. He loves the Gentiles as much as he loves the Jews. Salvation is for them as much as it is for the Jews. Forgiveness is for them as much as it is for the Jews, but they don't see that yet. So God wants to do something. But for God to do that, he's going to have to work through people. But to work through these people, he's going to have to do something in these people. Before he can work through them, he's going to have to work in them and on them. And that's what this story is. As we look at this story of Cornelius and this story of Peter, honestly, this story in Acts 10 and 11 is as much about Peter as it is about Cornelius, isn't it? It really is. We're going to see God working on Cornelius. So I want to ask you something this morning because I'm not interested in teaching a history lesson. We, we look at the Bible as it is, as it affects us and as it is applicable applicable to us as well. So I have a question for you this morning. Has God ever worked on you in a particular area? Something wasn't quite right. There was an area where you didn't measure up. It may have been in understanding. It may have been in attitude. To me that's one of the a lot of times where we see it in attitude or an outlook. And Here's God, and here we are, and God starts working on us because us, He wants us to be like Him. He wants us to measure up to Him, but a lot of times, God is also working on us because He wants to do something with us. He wants to do something through us, and until He can work on us, He can't work through us, right? He's got to work on us, and then He starts working through us, and that's the story that we see here. And so... We look at Peter this morning, and 
I, I'm so glad it was Peter because I honestly think, you've heard me talk about it before, I think of all the disciples and all of the apostles, Peter was the most stubborn. Peter is the most set in stone. Peter is the least likely to adjust. I really do think that. I really do think that. And God the Holy Spirit puts his finger on Peter. It could have been John, the, gospel, the, the, the apostle of love, right? But it's Peter the stone, the rock, okay, in a, in a good way one day, but sometimes it was kind of a bad way, wasn't it? And so we look at that, and we see that when the story begins, Peter has already made progress. How do I know that? I know Peter has made progress because he's living in the home of who? In, in Joppa, whose home is he living in? He's not staying at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> He's not staying at, the, he certainly wasn't staying at the Shangri-La. He couldn't afford that, okay? Where was he staying? The home of? No, before he gets to Cornelius. In Joppa, he's staying in the home of? Simon the Tanner, okay? Remember, ah, oh, yeah. Y'all have to go back and read Acts, okay? <laughs> you got to go back. As I've been going through Acts, I, at this point, I have probably read through Acts maybe 60 times now, 50 or 60 times, and I'm getting so much out of it. So he's staying in Joppa. He is outside of Jerusalem. Don't worry, they'll handle the drilling that's not supposed to take place on Sunday. <laughs> they'll, they'll take care of that. So he's staying in Joppa, which is up the coast from Jerusalem, and he's staying with Simon, and Simon is a tanner. What does a tanner do? A tanner takes dead animals and removes their hides and uses the hides for various things. He will use it to make uh, parchment, uh, and that's where much, many of the early manuscripts of the Bible were, were on parchment that were handled and prepared by tanners. Uh, it was also used for tents and for other things like that. So because he handled dead animals, the occupation of a tanner when he was Jewish was an unclean occupation. It was necessary, but it was unclean. And so most devout Jews didn't stay around tanners very much because they were sort of, they were unclean. But here we find Peter, he's staying with Simon the Tanner. So that's already one step. But as we're going to see, there's going to be a much bigger step very soon. And God's got to prepare him for the next step, right? So let's take a look at this. Uh, we know this part of the story, so I'm not going to read. Uh, by the way... We have Chinese scriptures if they're needed. I think they're not needed today, are they? Okay. If they're, if they're needed, we've got them in the back. Ruguo, Suyao. We've got Chinese scriptures back there. Okay. So we know what happens. Uh, Peter goes up on the roof to pray. And while he's praying, oh, great things happen in prayer. Uh, maybe one of the messages we're going to look at will be to kind of go through the book of Acts and say what happens when people are praying. Here we have something really great. While he's praying, he receives a vision from God. We know what the vision is. He sees heaven open. Now, I've, I have no idea what it looks like. That's just a picture from Google Images, okay? <laughs> so we don't know what it looks like, but it looks something like this, maybe. Who knows? We'll find out in heaven. What we know is this. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about i got to see that picture. All it is is all sorts of animals in a sheet, okay? And he hears a voice, and the voice says, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And that's appropriate because Peter's hungry, right? And uh, Peter, oh, yo, 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 very self righteously says, No, Lord. Okay, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. So we know that uh, as we look at this, there would have been snakes turtles, alligators, creeping things from the earth. So what we know is this. Peter was not Cantonese. Okay? <laughs> did I just offend any Cantonese? Janice, I didn't offend you, did I? No. Okay. We used to have a joke in Singapore. I don't know if it's a joke in Hong Kong or not. It was a joke in Singapore because Singapore had a lot of Cantonese. The Cantonese will eat anything with four legs except a table. Flora, did I? And anything with wings except an airplane. Flora, is that true? 
I, Flora said yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I hope I haven't offended anybody. I've eaten, I've eaten a lot of things too. The point is, for a Jew, those things were considered unclean. For a devout Jew, those were things that you didn't eat according to Old Testament law. So when Peter, when this vision comes and Peter sees it, Peter says, no, Lord. And the voice says to him, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Now, Peter doesn't know what this means. He just thinks it's about this vision that he has and all, these, all of these strange animals. By the way, if you'll read carefully, you'll see that in this sheet, there are animals that are okay to eat and animals that are not okay to eat for a Jew, for a Jew. And they're in the sheet together. That's what's important, right? They're all in there together. And so God wants to use Peter, but to use Peter, he's going to have to stretch him. He's going to have to help him see God's bigger than his limited view of um, than his limited view uh, of of the world, and God's going to have to do that, and it's going to take some stretching. I want us to see ourselves in this as well, because God still uses people today, and God wants to use you today. But a lot of times, what keeps God from using us, from what keeps God from working through us, it's not the devil. It's not wicked people out there. It is our own limitations. It's our own boundaries. It's our own outlook. And so God, as he worked on Peter, God works on us, although it may not be as dramatic um, as, a, as a vision. So here's Peter, and he says no to the Lord apparently three times. Now, I've got it in your notes, but I want you to see the irony of what Peter says. He says, no, Lord. But as it says in your handout, we can say no, and we can say Lord, but we can't say no, Lord. Because if he's Lord, we have to say yes, right? If we mean he's our Lord, we say yes. But Peter says, no, Lord, no, Lord. And he says it three times. Oh, this guy is so stubborn. Why doesn't God get somebody else that's easier to work with, that's easier to work on? Hmm, <laughs> we're going to talk about that. But see, God does the same thing with us, and God works on us the same way as well. So Peter doesn't yet understand that God is going to do something that's far greater than food. Now I want to pause here just a minute. Let's take a short detour, and then we'll come back. And I want to say something about dreams and visions and understanding them and interpreting them. If you believe that God has given you a dream or a vision, first of all, if you have a dream or a vision or, or in this area, first of all, what I want to say is don't mock and don't be skeptical. Some of us are of a more skeptical nature when, we comes to, when it comes to things like this, right? And we kind of, mm, we, we really back off and we really say, ah. And we, and, we, and we tend to look down at things like that. And what I want to say to us this morning, whether or not you have received a dream or a vision before, what I want to say to you is this. Be very careful about mocking or being skeptical or cynical in this area because God's Word says when the Holy Spirit is poured out from that point onward that your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, that this whole area that may seem unusual to you and to me, strange to many of us and we stand back from, is part of the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit. So if you've had a skeptical outlook you need to let the Lord change, and you need to choose to change in this area, right? Right. That was pitiful, but nevertheless, that's true. That's true. And you and I may say, but I've never had a dream, and I've never had a vision. I will be honest with you, I don't have a lot of dreams or visions myself. I talk with people at times that God gave me a dream, God gave me a whatever, and, and I'm, always, I'm always a little bit jealous. Um, so God speaks to us in many, many different ways. He really does. But what I want us to look at is this, and here, here's the point. Peter has this dream, and he has this vision, and usually when dreams and visions are given, the message of the dream or the vision often is not very clear, okay? It's often not very clear. What does it mean? I have talked with people before when they've had dreams or visions, and you know what they do? 
they immediately take their human reasoning and they sit there and they figure it all out. Okay. You see, in, the, in my dream, there was a boat, so it must have something to do with travel. So I think I'm going to be traveling and whatever. I'm, I, seriously, I remember talking with this woman one time. She said, I had a dream, and I looked down, and in my dream, I had chicken feet. And so that means, and she talked for 10 minutes about her chicken feet and how God gave her this or whatever. I'm sorry, but I don't think God gave her that dream with chicken feet, okay? <laughs> The point, and I'm not trying to, and you say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you're being skeptical, you're being cynical. I'm not trying to be skeptical or cynical. But what I am saying is this. If God gives you a dream, and if God gives you a vision, do not take your human reasoning and try to figure it all out. It must be this and it must be that. What does Peter do? Let's look. Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, and then the visitors come from Cornelius, and look at verse... Verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision. So he's there, he's been praying, and it's on his mind, and he's prayerful about it. What I want you to see is this. Up here where it says, wondering about the meaning of the vision, that means he was inwardly perplexed, and he doubted as to what it meant. He didn't understand what it meant, okay? So, and he's not trying to say, oh, this, is, this must be what it is. Um, I'm going to go to a new restaurant. And, and I'm going to eat some, some sort of food. Not at all. But he was waiting on the Lord. He was, had been in prayer. And it is on his mind. He doesn't try to make it mean something. So if you have a dream or a vision, don't try to make it mean something. Okay, let's go a little bit further. The second part, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, that means, literally, this is from the Amplified, so it gives the full meaning. He was revolving the vision in his mind, and he was meditating on it. Okay? So that's what this phrase, literally, that's what it means. So here you have these two things that Peter does in response to this vision that he doesn't understand, okay? Same pattern for us. So what happens next? Then, while this is, while this is going on, what do we see? He says, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. And so the Spirit speaks in relation to the dream or to the vision. So if you think God has given you a vision or a dream or a glimpse, sometimes it's a glimpse or whatever, may I say to you generally, don't go running off to your friends and say, I had this and this happened or whatever. What do you think it means? <laughs> I mean that. Listen. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and He has come to be your teacher. He has come to lead you and to guide you. So if you have a dream or a vision and you think that God gave it to you, but you don't understand the meaning, ask the Lord. God, what does this mean? Lord, would you confirm this to me? And let the Lord begin to make it clear. Because honestly, we can get in all sorts of trouble when we come into, into, this, into this type of thing. We can get mixed up in all sorts of things. Do what Peter did. Do what Peter did. There will be other times when God gives you a dream or a vision. It will be so clear to you. It will, be, it will be very, very obvious. But we see what Peter does here. And so because God is working on Peter... Peter goes with him. Well, we may or may not get to this a little bit later, but what I want to say is one thing. You can read it for yourself in the scripture. He says, do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So who gives further direction in this situation? Holy Spirit gives further direction, right? It's not some person saying, oh, this is what I think it, this is what I think it means. Okay? The Holy Spirit can let you know exactly what it means in confirmation. Okay? So he says, do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. But if you read your Bible, this is what you'll see. You will see that between here and here, Peter does something else. Because God's working on him and stretching him, and he's going step by step by step. So here's the next step. What Peter does is, to the men who have knocked at the gate and have said, Does Peter live here? Sent by the Spirit, sent by Cornelius. Peter goes to the gate. What do you want? And what does Peter do next? He invites them in. The people who are at the gate are not Jewish. There's a soldier and two servants. 
and none of them are Jews. But we already see Peter beginning to make progress. God's working on him. He hasn't made it all the way yet, but he's made it part of the way because the Bible tells us he invited them in. And if you, I don't know Greek and you don't know Greek, but if you were to study in the original, what it actually means is he invited them in, he hosted them, he cooked for them, he prepared, he, they were really his guests. Peter had never done that before. He'd never done that before, but God was stretching him. And then we see what's next. They arrive, they, they return, uh, they go back to Caesarea. It's about 30 miles away. And he goes to the entrance and then he meets Cornelius. And then Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. Peter didn't know that there was going to be a large gathering of people. If you read the story carefully, all he knew was somebody in Caesarea who's named Cornelius has had a dream and was you were supposed to come and you're supposed to talk to him. Well, there's a big difference between talking with one Gentile and a house full of Gentiles, isn't there? And so Peter, who's already being stretched, he goes, he talks with Cornelius, he went inside, he found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, look with me carefully at this, because this, this part is important. He says, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a gentle, Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. Ah, bingo, okay? Now the dream is becoming clear. There's still more to come. But I want us to stop right there for a minute because Peter says, you are aware it is against our law. Eh. Go back to the Old Testament. You read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Will you find that in any of those books? Yes or no? No. No. Is Peter lying here to try to protect himself? He says, you are well aware it is against our law. No. When Peter says this, Peter is so bound by culture and tradition of the, Jew, of the Jewish religion and the Jewish culture, he believes and he's holding on to everything that he has been taught. It did not say in the Old Testament law, you cannot associate with or eat with. God didn't say that when he was on Sinai and talked with Moses. That wasn't written down anywhere. But the Jews, in their zeal to, we have to be holy, we have to be pure, we have to be set apart. They had, they had said, okay, therefore, if we eat with somebody who is not Jewish, we might be defiled. Therefore, we must not eat with Jews. And they had built up a whole culture and a tradition that had become a weight. That's what Jesus fought against when he was still walking on the earth. And Peter is... I want us to see this this morning. He was one of the original 12 disciples. He walked with Jesus. He was now an apostle, a leader of the church. He was spirit-filled. The, the, first, the, the first part of Acts, pretty much, Peter's the hero. Peter's the star. And yet, we come to this point, and Peter still is bound by culture and tradition that he can't get beyond yet. And so God has to work on him. This speaks to me because I think we are here in this picture as well. Peter doesn't even realize he's in bondage. Peter doesn't even realize that he has a limited vision. He's, he believes, I'm following, I'm, I'm holy. I'm doing what Jesus said to do. I'm doing the right thing. And he can't see his limitations. I think a lot of times we can't see our limitations either, can we? I drive in Hong Kong. To me, to drive in Hong Kong, and I know there are a few drivers in this church, it can be a little scary. <laughs> Hong Kong drivers are quite aggressive, generally. Generally, that's a, that's a nice way of putting it. Hong Kong drivers are aggressive. Um, New York City drivers are aggressive too, maybe even worse. 
And when I drive, I, I remember one time, I think Pastor Renee and, and some others were in the car. We were driving home on a Wednesday night and I was taking them home and I was getting ready to pull over in the, in, to pull out into the, uh, anyhow, into the lane. And I looked in my rear view mirror and I started to pull and I think Pastor Renee was seated beside me. He says, hey, watch out. And I looked and sure enough, there was a car coming. Do you remember that, Pastor Renee? He doesn't. Oh, that's good. <laughs> the Lord removed the trauma from his mind. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, one time I was driving around sh near Shatin and I was in my lane and there was a car that was in the lane next to me and suddenly the car, sh I just barely escaped being hit. I beeped my horn and the person looked at me and he went, Huzz! and he wasn't angry. He was like, sorry, 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 sorry. He had a blind spot, just like I had a blind spot when I was driving. I looked back, but I didn't see the car. And I was thinking about that in relation to this. Peter had a blind spot, but the danger of blind spots is we don't know we have them. We look and we think we see, right? We look and we see, but there's a, an area that we don't see. And any driver will tell you, and other vehicles have that as uh, other vehicles and other forms of transport as well, there's a blind spot and we don't know that there's a blind spot. We look and we think, I can see everything, but we can't. That describes Peter in this story. And that describes us as well, right? Do you think if this man who walked with Jesus was a leader, was spirit-filled, was a man of prayer, and yet was still limited in understanding God, God's Word, and the heart of God, the love of God for everybody. Peter didn't see that. Is it possible that we too, every one of us, in some area, might have some blind spots? I kind of think so. In fact, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. And I include all of, all of us in this. And so as we look at this, Peter, he went inside, he says this, and then let's go a little bit further. When he sees them gathered and he hears Cornelius say, the angel said that you would come and you would tell us how to be saved. That's what it says later. You would tell us how to be saved. I want you to see what Peter says. Peter opened his mouth. This is the, the amplified, and I want you to see that because it gives the, the clearest picture. He says, most certainly and thoroughly, I now perceive and understand that God shows no partiality and is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he who has a reverential fear for God, treating him with worshipful obedience and living uprightly, is acceptable to him and sure of being received and welcomed by him. Now that's a mouthful, isn't it? You can read it uh, in a shorter form in some of the other translations. But what I want you to see is this. It is at this moment that Peter acknowledges humbly and openly before Gentiles, before non-Jews. May I paraphrase what Peter says? Yikes. <laughs> I had a blind spot. I, I didn't know that God loves you as much as he loves me. <laughs> really, you can put it that way. Has it ever come as a revelation to you when there's somebody you really, really have a hard time with and all of a sudden God speaks to you because you know God loves you, right? And then there, here's this terrible person, you think, we think, terrible person, so bad, so mean, so this, so that. And God lets you know, I love them as much as I love you. <laughs> what? It's a blind spot, isn't it? It's a blind spot. But for God to use us 
to reach people and to use us for his work, he's going to have to work on us. He's going to have to take care of these things. And so he does with Peter. Now we know what happens next, don't we? Let's see what happens next. We know that he begins to preach to them. We know that these non-Jews are so open that Peter only begins his message. He doesn't give an altar call. He doesn't give a salvation. Okay, raise your hands. How many of you believe in Jesus and you want to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Every head bowed, every eye closed. You know, we always do that, right? Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Okay, and first we let people put their hands up. And then sometimes we'll say, would you stand up? And then we'll say, come forward. Peter doesn't do any of that. He has, he's, I think he's still in the introduction. But their hearts are so open that they believe. And while Peter is preaching, what happens? The Holy Spirit is poured out. The Holy Spirit is poured out and salvation comes to them. Not only salvation comes to them, but the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them as well. And please just keep your focus here. It seems like there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of coming and going. Let's just keep our focus here. Um, we've still got a few more minutes as, as, as we go on here. Don't, don't let distractions distract you. And so, so we see this. God begins to move and God begins to work. Now, if you heard that, what, you, what, would, what would you and I say? Yay! Praise the Lord! This is great, right? What happens in the Jewish church back in Jerusalem? Soon the news reached the apostles and the other believers that the Gentiles had received the word of God. Yay! Praise the Lord! They put it in the prayer group. Please pray for these new believers um, who've been baptized in the Holy Spirit that they will grow strong in the Lord and that they will, be, that they will stand firm against, against persecution. Is that what they say? No. What do they do? They begin to criticize Peter. You entered the home of Gentiles. You even ate with them. And so here comes this criticism. And we look at this story and we think, what's the big deal? But for them, they haven't been changed yet. For them, they've still got this blind spot. And as, as we talked about this earlier, what did the Jews believe? The Jews believed God loves me more than he loves other people. May I ask you this morning, how many of you, please do not raise your hands. <laughs> you know what question I'm going to ask you. How many of you really kind of believe that you are extra special to God. Don't raise your hand. You kind of think, you know, you, you serve the Lord, you've been a Christian a long time, and you're extra special to God. How many of you believe God really loves me? In fact, I think God loves me a little bit more than He loves others. Or you may believe, well, God loves pastors, the pastors a little bit more because they're the pastors, or whatever. You, if you think that, that's a blind spot, okay? The Jews believed, okay, these Gentiles, they can, become they can become Christians, but first, they've got to become Jews. Did you know that's what they believed? They've got to become Jews first. Wow, what a stumbling block. What a stumbling block. And so what does Peter do when they begin to criticize him? Peter begins to talk with them, and what does he say? We've got just a few minutes left. Stay with me. Okay, what does he say? First of all, he begins to explain. What does it take? And if you want to, you can look at your notes. What does it take to convince the Jerusalem church? First of all, I think it takes Peter. Early on, remember I said, why do you think he chose Peter? Peter was so stubborn. Peter was so Jewish. I think God chose Peter because he was stubborn, because he was very Jewish, because he was very devout. If I can get Peter, then I can get the rest of the church, right? I think that's what was going on. And so the first thing that they hear is the testimony of Peter. It takes a clear, detailed testimony. Second, it takes the witness of the six men who went with Peter. If you read carefully, you'll find out that Peter took the six men from Joppa to Caesarea, and then he took the six witnesses, Jewish witnesses, from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Smart boy. Smart boy. He took six as a witness. And so then there's the witness of these other six, but it requires more than that. It takes more than experience. 
and it takes more than other people saying, oh yeah, I saw this. What does it take? Peter begins to talk and he says, so this, this happens, look at it. The believers, they were surprised for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Okay, what comes next? Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So we see that part. Peter responds immediately. We'll come back to this in just a minute. And then here's his testimony. Look with me. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he came on us. Now, here, verse, verse 16, and this is the verse that you need to hang on to especially. Then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Your standard and your measure, my standard and my measure, must be the Word of God, okay? It's not experience, although experience helps us. It's not the testimony of others, although the testimony of others can help us. It must be, more than anything else, it must be the Word of God, okay? It must be the Word of God. Because here's Peter. He sees the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit is poured out. The six witnesses see the Holy Spirit poured out on Gentiles. They've not been circumcised. They've not been water baptized. But the Holy Spirit's been poured out. What is their response going to be? How will they understand and interpret what has happened? Because it hasn't happened before. And it goes against what they understood because of their blind spot, right? It went against it. So how do they understand it? How do they understand it? By Scripture. They understand it by Scripture. Anytime you and I have an experience and we don't understand, spiritual, and we don't understand the experience, take it to the Bible. Take it to the Bible. Anytime somebody else comes to you and says, oh, there was this, 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 and this happened, and that happened, and then, oh God, and this and that, and then it sounds really weird to you, but they said, but it was their experience, what do you do? Take it to the Bible. You take it to the Bible. Always. That's how we stay in the correct road, in the correct pathway, and that's how our blind spots are gotten rid of. That's what happened with Peter. Peter looks there. They're baptized in the Holy Spirit. How do I understand that? How do I interpret that? Then I remembered what the Lord said. I remembered the words of Jesus, and that's what you and I have to do as well. The final proof is always the Word of God. You say, are you sure? Yeah. Look at Matthew 8 and 11. If they had paid attention, they would have seen Jesus said, Gentiles will come from all over the world. If you go all the way back to Isaiah 49, you'll say, this is a prophecy about Jesus. You'll be a light to the Gentiles. You'll bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. If you go all the way back to Genesis and Abraham, what he will say, you will be all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. That's scripture. And this was all scripture that they had. They had all of that. They had heard Jesus say that. They had the Old Testament. They had all of these, and they still had a blind spot. They still had a blind spot because this is how it must be. And so the Holy Spirit works on us. That makes, can you see it? Matthew 8. And by the way, there are many more scriptures than this. You say, Phew, glad you only gave us three, Pastor. That's right. I just gave you three. There are many more than that. Matthew 8, 11, Isaiah 49, 6, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And give me just a few more minutes, and we're going to come to a close this morning. When they heard this, they stopped objecting. What did they hear? When Peter said, Then I remembered the words of the Lord. And he says, Who am I to hinder? Because God wanted to do something. Who are we to hinder? And they praised God. They praised God. So as we come to a close this morning, very, very quickly. If you want to look at your notes, you can. This is how we're going to close. We've looked at Peter. What do we do if we want to make sure we keep going right and we want to make sure that we don't have blind spots or when we have blind spots that they're taken care of? Let's look at what, let's look at what we see from this story. We talked about this earlier in the beginning. So if there are dreams or visions and the message is not clear, and you don't understand, don't try to reason it through human understanding. Wait on the Lord. Continue in prayer 
in a spiritual frame of mind and wait for the Lord to make it clear to you, okay? So that's dreams or visions because we have all sorts of dreams or visions. By the way, may I say one thing? The enemy may also try to speak to you in dreams and visions at night. Now don't get scared, but I, I do want to say this. Have you ever been asleep at night and you haven't, you've had a nightmare? Sometimes nightmares can come just because of what we've eaten or this or that. But I think the enemy attacks us in that way. I really do, because he tries to rob us of things. May I say to you, if you struggle with nightmares before, or, or things that you think have come from the enemy at night, as you go to sleep at night, plead the blood of Jesus over yourself and just say, Lord, I, cover me with your blood. Fill your mind with the word of God. Think on things that are uplifting and encouraging. That's what the Bible says. And watch what you've been listening to and watching as well. May I say to you, if you love to watch horror movies and thrill... I, 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 sorry, folks. I'm just being practical. I really mean that. Some of us do, right? Yes. Uh-huh. If you love to... And you say, oh, now you're picking on me. No, I'm not. But watch yourself, watch yourself in th that area because the enemy works through fear. He works through fear. And we can open a door by what we watch. We can. And we can open a door by what we think on. So close those doors. Okay? Does that, does that make sense? Just, that's just simple. Close those doors and do what the Word of God says. Think on the things that are pure. Fill your mind with the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit keep you and guard you through the night. The Bible says He gives His beloved rest. He gives his beloved peace. That's in the Bible, and you can count on that. So, but, so you can reject those things, and you can say, Lord, I, I reject that. God, cover my mind. Okay? What else? We just talked about that. Make Scripture your standard. That's what Peter did, right? Always. Make Scripture your standard. Here's a verse for you, Acts 17. They, the people of Berea were more open-minded. They listened to Paul's message. It was new. And what does it say? They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. As a result, they believed. Ah, they searched the scriptures and they believed. Paul and Silas give the message. The Bereans search the scriptures and the scriptures verify. Okay? So let scripture be your standard. Next. Your, experience, your spiritual experiences generally should reflect other Christians' proven experiences. God is not weird, okay? You say, well, where does that, what do you, he's not. God's not weird. He's not, and, and if you think, whoa, or whatever, it's not God, okay? <laughs> it may be a human response, but it's not God. God's not weird. But generally, when we have experiences, as hum, uh, spiritual experiences, they should generally reflect the experiences that other Christians have. Does that make sense? If somebody comes to you and says, oh, I had this thing and, oh, oh, and, it, and you've never, nobody else has ever had this before and it, it's this strange whatever and it's, it's whatever, generally set it aside, okay? What did Peter say, remember? Peter said, I saw that they received the Holy Spirit in the same way we did experience matched experience okay don't scoff at prophecies test and prove all things we're going through this quickly because we need to end that's a scripture for you hold on to what is good oh that's a good scripture for you so don't be gullible don't just swallow everything but don't be cynical either okay don't be gullible don't be cynical Prove and then respond and put into practice everything the Spirit teaches you. Put into practice. That was fast right at the end, wasn't it? Put into practice. That's what Peter does. The Holy Spirit begins working on him. He invites them to come in, spend the night. He goes with them to Caesarea. Oh, God, you're doing something more. He goes into the house. He sees a group of Gentiles. He begins to preach. He sees the Holy Spirit poured out. What does he do? Let them be baptized in water. And then he defends, that. he defends the work of God. He put into practice the truth that he understood. If you will respond to truth, don't reject it. Don't sit back and say, yeah, I agree, I believe. But then you don't do anything about it. 
God will not give you more truth and more revelation. As we respond, as we walk with Him, He gives us more. Amen? Amen. Time to stop. Whew. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. <laughs> I need more air up here next Sunday. <laughs> Amen. Let's close in prayer very quickly. And next Sunday, we'll keep on going in the book of Acts. God, we thank you for our stubborn brother, Peter, who had a big old blind spot. But God, it reminds us that we are probably a lot like Peter, and we likely have blind spots and things that are hindering your work. But God, we want to be like Peter. We don't want to... Who are, who are we to hinder you? We don't want to hinder you. We really don't. So Lord, help us to put into practice what your word says, what we've seen today in the story of Peter and Cornelius and the, the truth of Scripture as we have seen it this morning. We thank you, Lord, for teaching us and for, and for guiding us and leading us. We thank you so much for the gift of the Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Andreas, sorry, would you...